here streaming already. So we just, I'm hitting stop, stop and start recording and stop and start streaming with, with every talk okay. that we switch in there now. That's it. If you need to <coughs> log in, your password is the same as the username for this. So I would, I'm wondering where I show up, because I like to move around. Uh, from basically like here to I can the end of the desk. So as I'm on screen, as soon as you hit the end of that desk, off screen, when you get well, how is it? Is your, keep going. Can, can, can I stand next to the gray point? That's kind of yeah, off you're, screen. You're still I want to stand right where he is. They got like both of those projectors. It's almost over my head. Okay. okay. If you're somewhere in the middle, that's yeah. All right. Let's get rolling. Yeah. 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 And then I assume this is the microphone. I hope I don't mm -hmm. shout into it. I might. Um, if you shout, my clip. I think. Go ahead. Try talking. Okay. This is me talking. Yeah, that's perfect. If I just talk normally, is the mic okay? Uh huh. So I don't need to project. Yes. Can you all hear me? Is the is the mic working where it projects to the room, or do I need to project to them? You got to Okay. Okay, everyone. Hello. Welcome. Uh, I think they're figuring out the mic right now. So. I'm just figuring out, if I speak at this volume, can you hear me in the back? Yep. If I speak at this volume, are you covering your ears on the stream? Mom, are you the only one watching the stream? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm ready to go whenever you tell me. Okay. Hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Ray. I am very pleased with how many of you are here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, one of the first things you might notice about me is that I have a deep voice. Um, what most people don't realize is I was actually born with a deep voice. I came out of the womb, wah, wah, wah. Now, the thing that you might not recognize immediately, though, is that I am actually a game designer. And... This is harder to recognize. Uh, now, my dad asked me one time, and it's the same principle. He said, how do you know if someone's a writer? How do you know if they write? And the, the answer is because they are writing. A writer doesn't come up to you and say, hey, I have an idea for a book. It's going to be a great book or a great movie. They come up to you and say, hey, read this, what I wrote. Look at what I did. And it's the same principle uh, with game design. So. Normally, I'll show people a game. Now, real quick, raise your hand. Give me some kind of, as I'm talking, uh, raise your hand. Give me some kind of visual cue that you're following along and agree. Who here is a game designer? Perfect. <laughs> so, uh, I, I design and publish my own games through uh, my own company called Azure House Games. So, I think I'm in the right place, Festival of Independent Gamers. You're game designers. I hope you're in the right place. I'll get to the topic of the talk in a few minutes and you can decide if that's where you were supposed to be sitting. Um, people, when they find out you're a game designer, in my experience, they'll ask you two questions, inevitably. And the first question I like, it's, it's oh wow, this is a great game. Um, how did you come up with this? How did you design this? You know, oh, how did you do that? And uh, I always inevitably respond with, like, what do you mean? Like, game design is what keeps me awake at night. I'm literally laying in bed thinking, oh, what would be a great game, or how would this mechanic work? And, uh, and for example, I went to a duck pond and watched the ducks in the pond. Then all night I couldn't sleep because I was thinking, how can I recreate the experience of being a duck? And, you know, swimming on the pond and looking for bread. And I had cards, and I had actions and dice. And I was like, this is going to be great. Turns out the game wasn't great. <laughs> but that <laughs> could be, needs maybe a little more development. That leads to the next question that they always seem to ask. And I don't like this one as much. It's like... Oh, you're a game designer? Cool. So, uh, how many games do you de have you designed? And it's like, again, I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like, are you talking about, like, the dozens of prototypes I have in boxes on my shelves? Are you talking about the hundreds of ideas that are circling through my brain constantly? Or are you talking about how many games I've published? You know, because the truth is, as game designers, we're going to think of dozens, hundreds of games. And a very select few of those will be any good. 
and even fewer of those will be worth publishing or trying to market. <laughs> and that's okay, you know, like, we're designing games, we'll come across good ones, and it's when we come across those good ideas that we want to stick with it and make it work and, and take it to the level where, and this is my idea of a successful game, is when you show it to somebody and they play it and you want it to show it to somebody else without tweaking anything about the game. That's the goal. <laughs> How do you get it to that point? Because I would love if I came up with an idea for a game and I spent hours working on it and I made the prototype and I showed it to someone and I didn't hate it in five minutes. To me, that would also be a success. <laughs> because in that, you know, what, what happens the most is you make it, you spend all this time on it, you show it to someone and you say, okay, I need to tweak this, I need to tweak that. And the, the common way to get into it is to just say, all right, I've made it, it doesn't feel right, so I'm gonna tweak this and hope it works. Okay, that didn't feel right, I'm gonna do some more tweaking and tweaking, and you're kind of just guessing and checking. Oh, was it not fun because of this? And you change it, and then like two weeks later, you come back and be like, all right, ignore all the changes I made in the last two weeks. Let's go back to the original, and I'm just gonna take it in another uh, direction. And, and it's a big, like, throw it against the wall, see what sticks, learning curve kind of process. So in order to save myself time and, and headaches, um, I came up with this process that I'm going to share with you, which is probably why I hope you're here. It's three steps to get your game unstuck. And I'm going to simplify it, so you're going to, now I'm not going to do the work for you. It's not a magic, okay, now you have a game. But the idea is you're going to take your good idea, you're going to apply these steps, and it's going to get you through the block. All right. Um, feel free to laugh if I tell any jokes. I would appreciate it. Uh, and if I ask any questions, feel free to shout out an answer. I won't single anyone out. And if you don't want to answer, you can just kind of raise your hand or nod. And I'm a little worried because a lot of my references I'm thinking now might be a little old. For example, uh, are any of you familiar with the show Boy Meets World? Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know it existed at one time in history. Yeah. Okay. So I liked it. Um, and there was one particular episode that stood out to me. And the, the premise of the episode is the characters are high school students, and they go into an academic league show on television. And that's the one where they ask a question, and you buzz in and answer it. And, um, and before I get into the rest of that, I want to let you know that I've split my talk into three sections. So if you are taking notes, you can write down um, the section headers of milk, eggs, and fit. Oh, sorry, no, that is my grocery list. Just a second. No, that is the list. So the first one is, uh, I'm going to tell you all the principles. I'm going to tell you kind of what the takeaway is as you're taking notes. It should be easy. So back to the story. They're on the show, and the way the plot goes is the show develops so that the correct answer becomes the stupidest answer, the most simple and banal answer. And so in it, there was a part where um, the characters are on there and the, the host asked the question. And I'm going to ask you the question just to kind of see if you want to answer. The question is, where does milk come from? What, it, what was that? Cow. Cow? All right. So that was what the characters first buzzed in. Cow. Meh, wrong. Okay, All right. well, the next one, so the next person buzzes in and they said, you just, I just heard it, say it again. The grocery store. The grocery store, <laughs> wrong. And so the character said, what? You know, and so they ask, where does milk come from? The sun. The sun, all right, maybe that's, that's too much. And okay. I hear udders, but that's kind of the same as a cow. There you go. Milk, and if you didn't hear, I'll repeat it. I'm gonna assume you have the same answer in the back. <laughs> the answer that they accepted was milk comes from the carton. And it doesn't get any more true than that. So if you are a user of milk, your experience with milk is it comes out of the carton. You don't care about the store. You don't care about the cow or the farm. The only thing you are experiencing is that moment when you pour it out of the carton. Right? And so I was like, I don't know how old I was, but I was like, wow, mind blown. Design philosophy. I didn't even know I was learning it. <laughs> uh, because that's the truth. So the... The title of this principle is Milk Comes from the Carton. And the concept is, and the action you're supposed to do is break your game down into the very simplest 
action possible. Like your answer can't be, if you can't think of a stupider answer, that's the right answer. Um, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is that's what your user, your game player is going to experience with your game, first and foremost. Is, so it's two things. One, if you can't understand your game at that simple of a level, there's a good chance that your player is also not going to know what they're doing or why they're doing it intuitively. So I'm not saying that that's gonna be the end result of your game. Your game will become more complex, but you need to start somewhere and then build it up from there. And if you know where to start at the most basic and simple level, then you'll have a grasp of what your game is supposed to be and what direction you wanna take it. Um, the other side of that is there's the core action. So let's, let's think of some examples. Um, chess, you're playing chess, the core action of chess. What do you, how do you play chess? You literally just pick up a piece and move it. That's how you play chess. How do you play? So, so my background is board games. So in my head, I'm thinking of a Power Grid and Seven Wonders and those games. If you're familiar with them, okay, we can talk about those. But also video games, it's like the core action of Mario. How do you play Mario? I think, yeah, yeah. I would say you move to the right. <laughs> you push the move to the right button. And now that leads to the other part is you have the core action. Um, so seven wonders as you're holding cards, you pick one, you put it down. Like that's how simple you should make it. Just what is the single action you're doing? The other side of that is what is the core experience? What at the base of your game do you want your player to experience? Um, so with this is, are you, do you get the milk thing? Do you get the examples? Is that all right? Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the egg, which is another joke. So I don't, and it's a joke because I don't understand where the egg came from. Like who was the person who invented the egg? That person should get a medal. Uh, and it's for the reason of, like unless, unless it was part of a game where they, they said, okay, but if I win, you see that funny looking bird over there, you have to eat the next thing to pop out of it. <laughs> you know, and so the guy loses, <laughs> and he like looks at the chicken, and the chicken looks at him, you know, and pops out an egg. And so the guy picks it up. It's not appetizing, this egg, right? It's white and hard, and you, you know, like, how do you eat it? And it just explodes when you bite it, you know? And so when that guy died of salmonella, I think people would have stopped eating eggs. But then the next person came along and said, okay, well, what if we put it in the fire and he holds it to the fire, it explodes, you know, in the open flame. At that point, I would have stopped and quit. But uh, then the next person comes along and is like, well, what if we boil it? Well, what if we crack it open and cook it and make an omelet? Okay, now I can get on board with an omelet. And that's the idea, is you take your egg to an omelet. And the moral of the chicken story is where did that egg come from? Now this isn't one of those trick questions where it's, what's the simplest answer? It's what's the most literal answer? And I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you a hint. And the hint is another old joke. It's guess what? Chicken butt. Chicken butt. <laughs> so the egg came from the chicken butt. And the key word there is butt, B-U-T. Because that's where you're gonna design your game. That's how you get an egg from an egg, which is your good idea. I've got a good idea. I've got a good mechanic I came up with. I was watching ducks and I had, I was like, I want a duck game. How do you get that to an omelet that people want to enjoy? And you apply a lot of butts to it. So that's the second principle is you design in the butts or the magic happens in the butt. B-U-T, but memorable. <laughs> um, and so once you get your game to its simplest form, let me give you an example of a game I made. It's called Build Up. It's a tactical block stacking game. And I came up, so the core, I was in my classroom and I said, what if there was a game and my idea was you're stacking blocks, you're trying to make the next person knock down the tower. So the core action is putting blocks on top of each other. The core experience that I was trying to go for was I want the game to feel like a European strategy board game but with blocks. And so to me, a European strategy board game was uh, 
players were making important choices each turn. You felt like you were making choices. You felt like you had a chance to win right up until the end and nobody was eliminated and there were things you couldn't control. So that's how I defined a strategy board game and that's what my core experience with the blocks was. So I said, okay, we have the game, you're stacking blocks, but you can't, they're not simple blocks, they're complex shaped blocks, but you can't just pick any block to add to the tower. You're limited by cards you have in your hand of what blocks you can choose, but you can't just put the block anywhere. It can only touch the last two blocks, but you only get points in the game if you make the next person topple the tower, but they might have an action card that stops you, but you might also have a counter move in your cards to keep it going back and forth. So it became this kind of choice tactical uh, interactive game that I felt captured the base experience of a strategy game, but was with blocks. So do you see how many times I used the word but? So that's the process, that's the action, is you start with your, I am putting, I'm playing Uno. I'm putting a card on the table. That's the action. But it can only be put down if it's the same color or symbol. But there's an action involved with putting it down. But if you run out of cards, you know, you'd, so there, you'd, you'd go through that process with your game. And that's why I say that the design is in the butt. And that's where the magic happens is because that's where you're going to come up with the rules of your game. And you're going, that's where you do the work. You know, that's where you make the hard choices of what you want the rules to be. The benefit of splitting it up into that simple but mechanic <laughs> process is that allows you to see at every step what's working and what's not. And so you can separate it into those simple but statements and you can put them apart and you can look at this one and say, does this contribute to the core experience I'm going for? Is this adding to what I want my players to experience? or is it taking away from it? Is this what's confusing players when they play, or is it so intuitive that it fits in and everyone says, of course? Or, or is it something that somebody's always forgetting and it's not intuitive? So the, the benefit of it is when you break it down like that, it allows you as a designer to methodically pick what works and what doesn't. Um, all right, Robin Williams, that's relevant still. I mean, his comedy. <laughs> he, he's my favorite comedian and actor growing up. And he had a bit where he talks about the invention of golf. Have any of you ever seen it? I recommend you go watch it. It's hilarious language warning. I'm not going to do an impression of it, but, but I will give you a kind of synopsis paraphrase of it. So he talks about how golf was invented in Scotland by a Scot who just essentially says, you know, I've thought of a game. We're going to take a knock a ball into a ball into a gopher hole. And, and his friends say, oh, like, like pool. And he's like, no, not pool. Forget pool. Not a straight stick. We're gonna have a little curved bent stick. Oh, kind of like croquet. No, forget croquet. It's not a few feet away. We're gonna put it the whole hundreds of yards away. <laughs> oh, like bowling. No, forget bowling. We're not putting it straight. I'm gonna put trees and bushes and grass and everything to mess up and you're gonna, you're gonna sit there whacking away at the ball and every time you swing, you feel like you're gonna have a stroke. And he's like, that's what we'll call it, a stroke, because you wanna die. <laughs> he's like, and at the end, we'll put a little flag just to give you hope and mess with you. <laughs> and so that's, when I heard that, that's where I learned about this principle of you start with something simple and just keep adding in the buts, okay, but, but, but. The core experience is he wants to make it so hard you won't feel like you're going to die, but you have hope at the end so that when you accomplish it, you feel like you have a sense of accomplishment. And if you can beat the other person, then, uh, then you win if you can do it in less strokes. And uh, there's another comedian who talks about the invention of the game of basketball where he wanted a game that uh, you could play ball indoors when it's cold outside. You might appreciate that here in Boston. And... Uh, and he says, all right, so I'm going to put the ball in the basket, and the basket's up high, and he's playing and thinking, and the janitor comes by, and he's like, oh, janitor, come over here, and I'm going to try to put the ball in the basket, and you have to stop me. And the janitor's like, okay. And so the guy takes the ball, and he comes walking up, and the janitor hits him in the face with a mop. The guy's like, ah, oh, no, you can't do that. They're like, no contact, you know. And, so he, and then the, the bit goes through all the steps of 
making it. So hopefully with some of your games, a famous comedian will make a bit about how you invented your game and there'll be some comedy in there. But, B-U-T. Uh, but there's a third principle. And do you, so we've got the, you break it down to the simplest form, you get the milk from the carton, you break it down from your egg to your omelet, and the next principle is, um, there's another show. Are you familiar with Friends? There's a character, Ross. And this one I call the principle of Unagi. There's an episode where Ross called, now Unagi is sushi, it's freshwater eel. But he's explaining to the other characters that it's a constant state of awareness in karate, where you're always aware of all the danger around you. And so I can't use Unagi because that refers to karate. So we need another term um, for game design, constant awareness, and I'm going to call it sashimi. And so the idea I mentioned earlier, if you're a game designer, you're constantly thinking about games, you're constantly designing games. So if you go through the process of simplifying your game to its basic and then building it back up with all the butts and you still feel stuck, it's a little bit cliche to say it, but walk away. Stop designing that game. How do I design this game? Stop designing it. What? <laughs> Don't do it. And the reason is, it's cliche to say that because it's, oh, your mind will open up. You know, you'll have new focus. You'll have a new insight if you think about something else. There's a lot of truth to be said about that, but I want to take it beyond that. Um, if you stop designing the game and you go out and do something fun, like I've been, I've had deadlines where I'm working on a game and I will be so focused on one problem that I cannot overcome for days and my wife will be like, enough, we're going out and doing something and we'll drive out, we'll have dinner, we'll watch Ducks on a Pond and on the drive home, I'll be like, I get it. I know how to solve my problem. It was so easy. Why didn't I see this before? You know, because I was so focused on it. So there's that aspect of it, but there's also the aspect of the invention of the Dyson vacuum. So the Dyson vacuum is the one with the big wheel on the bottom and the cyclone bagless bag. And, and the way that was invented was way back, the guy who created it first, he came up with the ball barrel which was a wheelbarrow with a ball at the bottom so it was easier to turn in the dirt. And it, he was selling it in a Sears catalog, he made awards for it, and then he moved on and I, would, I don't know the exact numbers, but like decades later he was working at another company and he came up with um, a cyclone to separate paint particles in a big factory. And he was like, great. And he was doing that. And then he had the idea, like, what if I applied that to a vacuum? And it took him like 5,000 prototypes but he combined the, the ball from his ball invention and the cyclone from his factory invention and he put them together and he made the Dyson vacuum, which is, I don't know a lot about vacuuming, but apparently it's, it's the thing. Anyways, the thing that I do think is interesting is he dissected past ideas and built something newer and better out of it. So if you have a brilliant idea for a game mechanic and you know that it's great, but you can't seem to get the other pieces to work, that's okay. If you go out and do something different and start designing a new game, you're going to be like, okay, I have a great theme, but I can't think of any mechanics. Maybe a few months later, you're working like, oh man, I thought of this great mechanic, but I don't have a theme that works for it. And you look back and you put them together and bam, you've got your hit. And for that reason, I never, okay, I say never, but, my wife would disagree. I don't throw away old prototypes. I don't delete old files. And I always save copies as I'm developing it. When I make a drastic change, I keep the old file just because I know, well, maybe I've completely changed it this direction, but I can still reuse the old idea later on. And so the thing is about sashimi is if you are a game designer, you're constantly designing. The thing is sashimi, isn't something you do, it's something you have. And if we make a reservation, we can be having sashimi in about 30 minutes. <laughs> so I thank you for your time, and I hope this has been helpful for your game designs. And uh, feel free to ask me any questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.